Welcome, everybody. Good morning. My name is uh, Sebastian, and today I want to talk about debugging. Because debugging is a super important subject that we don't talk that often about at C++ conferences. And my title already says it all. Why is that important? Well, because unfortunately, I'll say none of us is able to really program correctly in all cases, right? So inevitably, when we make mistakes, uh, we have to find out where we made them and where they are. So who's this talk for? This talk is for, let's say, two groups of people. There are people who said, hey, this is a good talk uh, for people who are starting their C++ career and who need maybe some ideas on how to proceed systematically uh, when you're trying to debug a program. But I've also heard people say that, hey, I've been doing this for a while, but this is a good reminder of how we should do things, whatever that means. OK, so before we start, we have to make clear what we're actually talking about. What is, what, is it, what is a bug? What are we looking for here? So you could say that your program has some kind of specification, right? Typically, that is implicit somewhat. So it's something that you may have documented something in some tickets. There might be some shared idea in the minds of you and your colleagues of how things should work. And rarely in some security conscious context, maybe you have actually a written specification. And now your program has a bug, of course, if it doesn't conform to that specification. But typically, you don't receive the actual information where the bug is. You receive a bug report, which is more or less just a description of a symptom. Something is going wrong. And now you have to find out where the actual mistake is. So the first step when we're trying to well debug, but that means in general we are trying to ship programs that are as free of bugs as we can make it we have to get a lot of bug reports to filter out the important ones. And so bug reports can take many different forms. Should I take this a bit higher? Do you hear me better? So this is a bug report. I received that message, I think it's 15 years by now. <laughs> and you, you can see I remembered that <laughs> when I wrote this talk. Because this is a bug report. I, could remember, I can remember I couldn't help that person. But it's not a very good bug report, is it? Uh, because clearly it's lacking in detail. Uh, and maybe the tone is a bit off as well. So there are better ways to get bug reports, to get informed that something is going wrong. Maybe your program crashes. That is good. That's a clear indication something is going wrong. Maybe you get a core dump along with the crash. Maybe you just chose an error message. Uh, you write a line to a log file that something unexpected is happening. Or you have some other misbehavior that is somehow observable. Some dialogue doesn't look right. How many of those do you notice? And crucially, how many of those would you notice if they only occurred on a customer's machine? Um, and how can you make sure that you get all those bug reports? Well, luckily, we're writing in a language that has a compiler. So the first line of defense, so to speak, in writing better software is our compiler. It will tell us if we made type errors. We can help it along somewhat when we're writing more static asserts. That might help us catch some errors. We can also try to evaluate more things at compile time in const expert statements. Now, does anybody know what class of bugs that would eliminate completely in that part to evaluate at compile time? Any idea? Yeah. What? The initialization of bubbles and status. That's one good point. I was referring to something else. Undefined behavior. behavior. Very good. Uh, there was even a talk at CppCon a while ago that uh, people developed their entire microkernel and const expert expressions to prove that it had no undefined behavior. Now, after compiling, you might have your unit test, other automated testing of some kind. But that will still leave bugs in your code. And we have to find those at runtime, inevitably. And what we do at ThinkCell, for example, is that we have uh, very strict error checking at runtime. That means whenever we are calling an external API, we are checking all the return values, or we are always checking the return values. And we're always reporting unexpected return values to our backend. What does that mean? Well, it means, for example, if you're trying to open a file, there are expected cases. The file doesn't exist. You're not allowed to read it. These are things that will probably happen 
sooner or later and you have to handle them. But there are also unexpected errors. If create file suddenly returns error out of paper, that would be weird. Uh, I would like to investigate that, where that is coming from. So we would report error out of paper to our error reporting backend. We're also having a lot of, writing a lot of asserts and we're keeping them in not only debug builds but also in release builds. And asserts that fail will also trigger an error report that is sent to our backend. This helps us to enforce invariance, um, to make sure our program when it runs stays on that track of behavior that we defined, that we thought about. And we want to know as soon as our program uh, deviates from that path. So there's an entire talk by my uh, boss Arno about our approach to error handling that I invite you to, to check out. In our backend, this looks like this. So we would have this database of error reports where those hundreds of thousands of error reports come in and we can filter them by build of our software, by operating system, by error message, by uh, they are grouped by line of code where they occur. So we can quickly find out what are the most common issues that happen on customers' machines. Um, these are very often issues we couldn't reproduce in-house because they depend on some environment we didn't have. So it's very good for that alone, to have such an error reporting infrastructure. And there are open source solutions to do that, right? There's Google Crashpad, I think it's called now, or BrickPad, and there are other error reporting things you can plug in your code. Okay, so let's say, with all these tools, we have made sure that we receive as many bug reports, partially automated bug reports, as we can. Now you know you are informed some bug happened. Maybe a message popped up on some customer, on some client, on some colleague's machine, and a cert failed or something. What do you do? What can you do? You don't know anything about it. You don't know how frequent this is. You don't know how to reproduce it. Is it worth looking at that? Is it worth it having um, a process in place at your company where you can just call on each other and say, hey, I have this thing, can you look at it now? And I would argue it's a very, very good if you, have, if you can organize your team that way, that you can still do that without going through some lengthy error reporting process. There's this famous quote by Gordon Latwin, who was the architect for ms 4. He said, one in a million is always next Tuesday. And what he meant was that computers back then had become so fast that even a bug that had a super low chance of occurring maybe one in a million times would probably occur by next Tuesday because your computer is doing so much. And that is even more so true today. So knowing nothing about a problem might still be your rare chance to analyze a problem you will never see again. Maybe you're just looking at a thing that is super hard to reproduce in the lab. Maybe it has an obvious fix if you just look at the code. And you can be sure that once you roll out your product to a million customers, this situation will occur maybe thousands of times for your customers. So you can check it out, you should check it out right now. But what can you do without any further information? Well, at the very least, you can form an hypothesis right there, right then, on what might have caused that situation. Maybe you were missing some assert, some invariance that you should have documented better. Maybe you can improve your error report to get you informed earlier the next time this happened. And this leads us to our first quiz. Because I brought some practical examples, some real life bugs from our code base. And uh, maybe you can find out what the issue was. So here we have something, uh, we want to make an HTTP request with some asynchronous API. So we have to create some delegate object. And that delegate object um, is called when new data arrives. It has this function on new data. And when new data arrives, it uh, locks a mutex and checks, hey, do I have new data? Or um, did an error occur in my request? And then it sets its internal state. And then it notifies everybody waiting for that asynchronous call. And we're super lazy. We actually want to do that HTTP request synchronously. We're just waiting. So we're setting up this delegate um, and then we're waiting for him to change his state and tell us, did he have data or did he have an error? Um, and when he had an error, then we uh, throw an exception and destroy our HTTP request object and exit. So this would crash, rarely, but it did crash. And it crashed, did I 
Now it crashed here on the left on the notify all. The notify all would crash because the condition variable had been destroyed. And I'll give you a hint because I don't have that much time. Well, this delegate is a member of our HTTP request. So it is probably destroyed because we're throwing an HTTP exception there, destroying our request and the delegate. But why? Why can this happen? I have a mutex. Everything looks good. Yes, Roy? Spurious uh, wake-ups. Uh... Spurious wake-ups. Great. These actually happen. Who knows what spurious wake-ups mean? Okay, great. It's always good to ask that question in a positive way, because otherwise nobody raises his hand. <laughs> um, spurious wake-ups mean that we are waiting here on that right side. We are waiting on that condition variable. And it clearly says, hey, wait, um, well, wait until that state variable changes uh, his mind, right? And we're clearly notifying him when that state variable has changed the state. But what can happen, and I think I'm taking, can I take that mic off? Yeah. Sorry. What can happen, that's what spurious wake-ups mean, is that there is a very tiny, very short moment when we've set that state variable to, let's say, error, but we haven't notified anybody yet. So this yellow line of code hasn't run yet. And spurious wake-ups mean that just at that nanosecond, our condition variable will wake up. That's a spurious wake-up. And we haven't even called notify yet. So that will wake up. It will check, hey, my state is error. Cool, I'll exit. I'll throw an exception, I'll destroy my delegate, and then this runs on a destroyed member variable. Which is why the coding, the C++ guideline explicitly says, put the notify inside the mutex. That is almost always uh, what you want. And we have that happening, rarely, but it did happen on our backend, like once every few weeks. And you could never reproduce that. You could just see it happening and then think, how, how, how can that happen? And then walk your way backwards from there. So typically, we're not that lucky. Typically, we can't fix bugs just by staring at them. We have to analyze them uh, a bit more deeply. Oh yeah, that's the solution. So we have to start a lengthy process that we have to plan well. And debugging is an iterative process, right? We get a bug report. We think about it. We analyze it a little bit. We form an hypothesis on what could have caused that bug. We test that hypothesis. We are probably wrong. We think again, form a better hypothesis, and so on, until we arrive at a fix we can actually implement that really fixes the problem. And it's important to do that systematically and to do it right, not to rush to conclusions, etc. And we're going through some techniques on how to do that on the following slides. Because we have to do this well, otherwise we're going to look grumpy like this little generated monster here. It's a grumpy in front of our computer and nothing's working. So the first step that we have to do is we have to get better reproductions, right? So if we want to repeatedly analyze a bug, well, we have to be able to repeatedly reproduce it in the first case. And a reproduction, that's not a binary state. A bug is not either reproducible or not reproducible. There are different shades here of, let's say, reproducibility. You have the gold standard where you know that a bug is always reproducible in a debug build with an interactive debugger attached on any machine you try it on. That is great. You can, you can analyze that problem. But then it goes down until you arrive at a case where a bug is only reproducible sometimes, only in builds with specific optimization settings, and only on very specific machines. And the first techniques that we have to try are techniques that make things easier to reproduce, that move us up here, that force issues to appear, so to speak. So what can we do? So there are issues that are only sometimes reproducible, let's say. And there are a couple of tools that we have to use, or should use, to make those tools appear more frequently, um, reliably, to make them um, analyzable. So, for example, address sanitizer, threat sanitizer, UV sanitizer are important tools. 
Who here uses address sanitizer regularly? Good, some people, but not, not half the people. So you should use that. Sorry? Other tools, all right. <laughs> Who's using Valgrind? Okay, together maybe half the people. <laughs> okay, so what Address Sanitizer does, it will instrument your C++ code and will instrument all the memory allocations and deallocations you make so that it can tell you when you're accessing a variable that has gone out of scope, that has been destroyed already. Because very often that will still work, right? You have a variable that you deallocate, but you still have some reference or pointer to it. The memory has not been reclaimed, so the data is still there. Accessing that variable will still work. And you have a bug that will only appear once you change compiler settings, change some code in the environment. can be super hard to find. And address sanitizers will make that reliably uh, appear. Bugs that only appear sometimes, they could be timing issues of course. Uh, in those cases, uh, maybe you have some interaction with some other tool, some other process that has to be just right, just have the right timing for the bug to appear. In those cases, maybe you can write uh, stress tests. You can change your program to make, to execute uh, code where you suspect a bug is, to execute that more frequently, to force issues uh, to appear. Uh, of course, you should always use interactive debuggers. I hear again and again that not everybody uses interactive debuggers. But they make some issues disappear because they change the timing, for example. They make your code execute slower, typically. In such situations, maybe you cannot reproduce the bug anymore once you attach a debugger. But maybe you can still write to a log file and have a debugger uh, and still reproduce the bug uh, that way. And in the worst case, if everything else fails, you can actually write code. It's something we often forget when we're trying to debug, we're trying to find code that is broken. We can write more code to find out, uh, to analyze the system when it, when it enters an erroneous state. We can try to write code to print more stuff, for example, so we can understand the system state better. And there are issues that are only reproducible on some machines, of course. It's a natural idea that maybe this has something to do with those specific machines. So we want to gather all the information about the system environment, everything that can be relevant operating systems, uh, CPUs, build numbers of your software, all, all, all the other tools that can interfere with your application. And when you're writing for, on a desktop environment, this can be a lot of things. Uh, it can be virus scanners blocking files, system tools that hook system functions, system management tools that disable parts of your software or digital rights management software that's interfering. There are a lot of things that can go wrong. And then you can maybe go and reproduce that environment in a virtual machine. Maybe if that fails, you can debug the issue on client machine. And if everything else fails, you can maybe get a client to ship an identical machine uh, to, your, to your offices. We, have, uh, we did that as well. And here it's important to always keep an open mind. You know, when you're starting this, when you're thinking like what could be the cause of that problem, you shouldn't focus too early on possible causes uh, that can lead you down the wrong alley. So it can also still be a timing issue. Maybe you're testing this on a very slow machine or in a very fast machine or in a very busy machine and all these things interfere with your program. And if everything else fails, then you hopefully have good error reporting, like I initially sketched, um, that will lead you to more cases where that bug is happening that are maybe easier to analyze in friendly environments. You can write and ship more analysis code when you have such error reporting and have your error reporting tell you, hey, I've, I found a possible cause for that issue. If you have really, really great error reporting, you can even try out fixes live and have your error reporting report back if that fixed the issue. But we only did that once ever, I think. And the worst case, maybe you can only look at the program state after a problem appeared. Maybe there's some output that your program writes that you can analyze and then walk your way back again to what could have possibly caused that output. And that leads to our second little quiz. So we had a customer report that said uh, starting our software failed and according to the log file it failed with some allocation exception. 
So um, the, we could look. Uh, we could look at our error reporting backend, see what the what the customer had for error reports, and we could see that there was a failure reading our settings file, and the settings file contained some bogus data. So we couldn't reproduce it, but we could find out, thanks to our error reporting, that reading the settings file failed. And then we could get the settings file from the customer and look at that and say, okay, that clearly contains uh, wrong data. More precisely, it contained data in some number formatting string that you would expect once, and it contained a 2 to the power of 18 times, which is a peculiar number. It's not any random number. It's the power of 2. And we thought, well, maybe something doubled that string 18, 18 times. So we looked a bit deeper, said, okay, there's this vector. We have a vector that is getting too big. That's a vector of a pair and some size t that would be an index into some string, and then that format identifier. Let's say we want to insert a number format somewhere in a string. Okay, so that doubled. And it's important that this vector was shared in shared memory between different processes. Okay. So we went a bit deeper and said, okay, what defines that vector size? Well, the vector size is the size in bytes minus the size of the individual elements. And now maybe you're thinking, maybe you have an idea. Okay, you share this between different processes. You have this calculation for the size of an individual element. Does anybody have an idea what could go wrong here? Alignment, always good, no? Could be, could be, but wasn't the case. Anything else? So the right-hand side contains size of size t, specifically. Is that alarming to anybody? It yeah, might not be the same. It might not be the same, specifically, if you share the process with the memory between 32-bit and 64-bit processes. Correct. That was, that was indeed the cause. Why that doubled was now a bit of a random, random coincidence. But that was indeed the, indeed the problem, yes. Okay, now let's say we have, a, we have a reproduction. Now we can try out different hypotheses and now we have to actually find out what is the bug in our program. Because typically that is not where the crash appears. The bug might be somewhere else. It might be somewhere else in your code. It might have happened way earlier in your code. And you have to walk, walk your way backwards, so to speak, from the moment your application crashes to the moment where you figure out, oh, I've made a mistake here. And how do we find that, that location? And again, we can use all the sanitizers. We can use interactive debuggers. Um, that, helps, that helps a lot. But there are a lot of other tools we can use to quickly nail down um, on, the, on the cause, on the actual bug. Uh, a good technique that we use a lot is to um, first gain some understanding of a larger system that we're maybe not super familiar with by adding a lot of trace code. So you want to find out who calls what, in what order. And there's a good old printf debugging that we used to use uh, a lot. But that has a downside. So printf debugging, of course, means you're entering, you're inserting printf statements and inserting lock statements that way that print out useful information. That requires recompiling every time you change one of those lock statements. That is super annoying. That takes way too long. We want to debug this faster. But what's way better is to use tracing breakpoints in your debuggers. Who here uses tracing breakpoints? Well, also not that many. Good. Um, so tracing breakpoints are breakpoints that are supported by all the debuggers that don't interrupt the execution when they are hit, but they can only they can print out messages that's supported by GDB, LDB, and Visual Studio, and they are much more powerful than printf. So first of all, they don't require recompilation when you change them. You can print out variables, messages, whatever you want, without recompiling. And they're strictly more powerful because you can add them to places where you cannot add printf statements. You can add them to operating system functions, for example, to find out well, which files are opened when your application starts up or something. You can add them to binary code addresses. They can also be useful. GDB and LDB are even more powerful. You can make them print uh, the stack trace when they hit a certain breakpoint. So you can not only find out what is called in which order, 
You can also find out quickly by whom that is called. That can be very useful information where that is coming from. And they can even be scripted. LDB and TDB can be scripted with via Python. But again, you have to be careful. The more tracing you add, the more you change your program, the more likely you are to make a bug disappear. And that's the one thing we never want to do. If we are suspecting that the issue is specifically maybe in your interaction between your program and the operating system, there are some operating system specific tools that make, um, that make this easier. You don't have to add printf statements to know which files are opened by your application. Windows has process monitor for that, for example. So you can find out which files your application is opening, which registry keys are read, etc. And macOS has dtrace, and Linux has a number of different trace tools, depending on what you're more, most interested in. And you have to know, you have to get to know your operating system, right? When you're trying to find out uh, a problem in your interaction with the operating system. You have to know a lot about it. And that's a part of debugging that takes a lot of time and experience. You might want to know how file locks work on your operating system, how shared memory works, uh, how the virtual memory works, um, I.O. in general, etc. So there are different aspects here you might have to learn about first before you can usefully debug a problem. Sometimes you have, you have an idea that you had a working state of your program. Like two weeks ago that bug wasn't there, but now it is there. And what you can do is you can analyze those two, uh, those two parts in parallel, or you can walk your way back through your version control to find out exactly what change, what commit introduced a bug. And that's, uh, that's a very important technique because you want to find out what that specific change that introduced a bug, what that was trying to achieve in the first place. If you don't find that out, you fix the new bug, you have the, you have the, you have the, if you run the risk of reintroducing the old issue that was originally fixed. So if you can do, for example, a bisect on your version control and find out what caused that bug, you can look at both issues at the same time and maybe find a solution for both issues, the old one and the new one. You can also step through the working and the broken version in parallel and see, find out where they differ. That might, that might be a, a good technique. Or you can do the reverse and disable code. Uh, and comment out code and, and try out if the bug is still occurring to nail down the, 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 the line of line in your code that, that causes a specific bug. And that requires knowledge of your code base, of course. It can be super time consuming, but it can also be the best technique in some cases. And last but not least, you can always improve the code when you're trying to find a bug. So maybe you're thinking through some part of your program nobody has looked at in a long time. Maybe you find out while you're thinking through it that some invariant should hold that isn't yet documented, that isn't yet asserted. Maybe you can introduce that assert now, or you should, uh, and check that in. Maybe that will help you find the actual bug because it will trigger the next time you try your reproduction because that invariant doesn't actually hold. If you're dealing with uh, special legacy code, you can start introducing new programming techniques while you're trying to find out what goes wrong. And that way, you're not only maybe fixing the bug you're looking at, you're also fixing other bugs by introducing better memory management techniques. Uh, you're fixing maybe other bugs you haven't even reproduced yet. So that's always a very good idea. Clean up the code while you're thinking through that code. And then there's a number of very powerful reverse debugging tools, a lot of which um, people have presented at conferences. So there's uh, WinDebug and the Undo Debugger, and there's also RR on Linux that can do pretty much what we're trying to do here. They're trying to, you're trying to walk backwards from some crash to a situation in your program where something went wrong. And these debuggers, they do exactly that. They record a trace of your execution and then let you step backwards through time to try to find out where something goes wrong. And again, I've mentioned them very often. It's important to know your debuggers, to know your tools very well, right? Um, data breakpoints are another very good debugger tool. 
they let you interrupt execution when a specific memory address is read or written. That can be super helpful to understand the flow of data in your application. And I would say a good debugging technique, good final debugging technique, is to get at least passive uh, assembly skills or assembly reading skills. Uh, it's not often that you need to go down to assembly level to debug an issue. But when you have such an issue where that is necessary, then that becomes a very important skill. And here I brought such an issue. So we had an API, it's this get item from indices thing, that came from some external library. We didn't have the code for that. And I'm calling that here and I'm passing some indices to items I need. I'm passing four indices, I want to get some collection of the actual objects back. And now I'm calling that with four item, four indices, with that C style API, that's not very pretty. And I expect to get four items back, but I get only two. There's a bug in that library. And I would like to find out where that bug is um, to write a good bug report and to get that fixed because that's very important. Um, so what do I do? Where's an idea? How to find that? I want to nail down to where that goes wrong, where that external library goes wrong. I want to tell those programmers, here's your bug. Because otherwise they're not going to fix it. So how do I find that place? Step in. Step in. Good. That's because this is a you know this is a talk about debugging techniques and you should plan those ahead. So that's the point of the talk. You, know, you have a tool set. How do I do? How do I find that bug most quickly? So you could step in, but it's probably not the fastest way. It could be a lot of code. It's disassembly. It's taking. It's super hard to understand. Yeah. Exactly. You put a watch, you put a data breakpoint on the data. So at some point in that code, it's going to read that array of indices. So I use a data breakpoint. I tell the debugger, LDB in that case, to interrupt when that first element of that array is read. That's probably where the bug happens. Okay, and I do that and I find a location in the code that does a bit like this. So it takes a pointer to that first element in the array and then loops over the elements. But that is disassembly. So I find this instead. So this is ARM disassembly. I'm not sure how familiar you are with ARM disassembly. I'm still not very familiar with ARM disassembly. So I helped a bit and commented this. So the first line is getting the pointer to the data. The second line is getting that loop variable v. And then that third line is accessing our array. But you see it's shifting the v variable by three bits. So that's a multiplication with eight. So it's assuming our data is eight bytes long and not four bytes. That is weird. That is clearly a bug. So it's skipping half of my elements. That also explains why I get two elements back and not four. And seeing that, I could not only write a good bug report, I could also know what went wrong on the other end here. Because this piece of code was ported from Windows to macOS. On Windows, long and int have the same size. They're both four bytes long. And on macOS, they're not, for example. So they are, long would be eight bytes and int is only four. So that code was ported. Somebody didn't change a long to an int uh, or cast, did a wrong cast. And uh, it went wrong. And I could write that bug report and I could get that fixed pretty quickly. So here debugging disassembly was very helpful. Okay, so now we've practically seen the, the overview of the debugging process, how we proceed getting more bug reports, getting better at productions, nailing down with all the tools we have on what the problem might be. And there are different tools, debuggers, sanitizers, reverse debuggers, loggers. We have to know the operating system. But there's one technique that is super crucial to debugging. And if you don't have that, and if you don't train that, then your debugging uh, endeavor will, will fail. And that is that you have to be able and willing to question your own assumptions. Because you clearly made a mistake. We know that much. And now if you go back and always assume you've been right, then, well, You'll never find that place where you've been wrong, right? So that's very important. Go back and question all the assumptions you made. 
Okay. Now we want to write, we don't, don't only want to write to debug our program, we want to also make it better. So we want to fix that bug. We want to ship software that has a high quality and is as bug free as we can make it. So we want to fix that bug and ship it. And what should we do uh, to do that? So first, we should classify that bug. We, could, we should think a moment about what went wrong. What did we do wrong? And I would say there are like two kinds of, two kinds of bugs. There's one bug that I would call, you just didn't write what you meant. You made a little mistake. You forgot to initialize some data. You did some, made some memory management problem. Maybe you should have used the smart point and didn't, and now your memory management was wrong. Or you managed to override the stack somehow. Often, the fix could be a local change where you fix that little mistake you did. Or you should use a better programming practice and the problem goes away. So that's kind of a, a little bug you made. A local bug, if you will. Um, still, you might want to ch check if you made that bug elsewhere in your code as well. But it's a small fix. Or the other kind of bug is you wrote what you meant, but you meant the wrong thing. Your thinking was wrong, your mental model was wrong, and you need a new mental model. And you need to go back to the drawing board, as they say, and, and rethink your entire approach. Maybe you didn't understand the actual task very well. You didn't understand your own specification, the specification of somebody else's uh, tools that you're using. You didn't understand the input data you would get or the, the output data you were supposed to produce. You didn't understand your own requirements, in other words. You have to ask yourself, is my algorithm choice correct at all? Should I do something completely different? So you have to rethink a lot of, uh, a lot of your assumptions again. And it's tricky to tell those two cases apart, right? Let's, let's look at this little fake example here. You have, uh, you, get, you have a function that gets a vector of pointers and you iterate over them and call a function dereferencing that pointer. And now you get a bug report that this crashes. This pointer can be null, cannot dereference it. Now, we can do this, sure. Is that a good fix? I don't, I don't know, Might, maybe. But there are a lot of questions. Let's, let's assume this would be a code review, right? What, what could you ask? You could ask, where's that data coming from? Who's producing that data? Why is there a null pointer in that data? Is that, is that a, valid, a valid output of that first, of that previous step? Or is there another bug producing a vector with null pointers? And only if you've answered all that questions, you can, you can answer if that is a good fix or not. Maybe, maybe it's what you needed to do, but maybe you needed to do something completely different. So we have to look at the bigger picture always take a few steps back and wonder, how did we arrive at this situation? What are we trying to achieve? Are we using the right algorithms, the right tools to achieve that, etc.? cetera? Um, again, yes, we're thinking a lot of our assumptions. And only if we've done that, can we actually proceed to fixing, fixing that bug. And in a lot of cases, what people would advise is to say, find the, find the smallest possible fix that solves the problem. Because that has a very low chance of introducing new bugs. And that's, that's a good thing, right? And I wouldn't, I wouldn't phrase it like that. Because that, phrasing it that way has a, has a certain problem. Because people hear the small fix, and they don't hear the small fix that actually really, really, really fixes your problem. So they start to write a lot of small fixes. And over time, your code quality might just deteriorate by putting small fix on top of small fix, right? In the worst case, you didn't even fix the real root of the problem. You just fixed some symptom, some special corner case, made the real problem harder to reproduce. So don't think of the smallest possible fix first. Do it the, do it the other way around would be my advice. Imagine you were working in a situation without any constraints of time or money. And think of the, the biggest fix. What is it 
you really should have been doing. You probably know a lot more about the problem now after debugging it for days, maybe. How should you have solved that problem if you would solve it again from scratch? What would be the ideal solution? And then maybe you can figure out, hey, we can move to that ideal situation. Maybe we can take some steps, at least maybe in our development branch. We can move to that ideal situation bit by bit over time. And then you can ask the question, okay, knowing the ideal solution, what is the small fix I need now to put into my shipping branch, to ship to customers? And can I only make that maybe in our stable branch, but move to that ideal solution in the development branch? So this is how I would, I would phrase it. And then, of course, again, stepping, taking a step back, ask yourself, why could that happen in the first place? There are a lot of talks here, as well as the conference, about writing APIs that are uh, hard to use wrong and easy to use right, right? Did you also have a case where it was too hard to program correctly and too easy to make mistakes? Was there something missing? Did you miss a library feature, some helper, uh, an algorithm that you should have implemented uh, in some abstract way, some standard programming practice that you should establish maybe in your entire team or entire company. And can we fix that same problem elsewhere and thus prevent the bug from happening again and again and again? Maybe it's simple things, introducing smart pointers in your entire application, replacing self-written for loops with standard algorithm. That's always a good idea. Can you look through the code base for that pattern and find other locations where you can make the same uh, fix? And can you introduce that missing abstraction that would have helped you? And here, that missing abstraction can be, can be a lot of different things. So we have this in our code base, for example. Uh, so we had a lot of lo okay, uh, locations where you had some data and you sort it with a less predicate. And then you want to get the range of unique elements. And unique here takes an equal predicate. Do you see what in more complicated examples, could go wrong here? Anyone has an idea? What's an easy bug that can happen here? If you use floats. If you use that's always, always a bug. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, okay, with the equal, you mean with the equal predicate specifically? What? Why float? Or oh, just a guess, because floats. Ah, because using because float calculations are not super stable. They can give you different idea, different results. So, uh, yes, good point. That wasn't the problem. The problem here is that you're using two operations that use two different predicates, but those two predicates have to be compatible with each other. If the last is not comparable to the equal, because you've written your own predicate, that's kind of missing from that slide. Um, then that is wrong, right? The equal and the less. Have to be have to do the same thing, same compatible thing. We had this pattern, I think, uh, seventy times in our code base. So that's something we do quite a lot. And of course, some of them were wrong because people had written their own predicates and had gotten it wrong. Um, so we could introduce an abstraction for that, seventy-four times, and and fix that bug once and for all. And in our case, that was an algorithm that does just that: sort in place and make a unique range out of something. Other things we need abstractions for because they're hard to get right and we do them so often is error checking, for example. Error checking is super hard. So when you're trying to open a file on a POSIX system, there are so many things that can happen. Uh, in, on success cases, you get a non-negative return value. That's your file handle. You can get minus one, I guess it is, the invalid file handle. And the error variable says, hey, we were interrupted. You have to try this again. Or you get an invalid file handle and you get cases that you know can happen. You didn't have permission to read that file, the file didn't exist, etc. And then there are all the other error codes that POSIX has that hopefully don't happen. And again, like error out of paper, if they ever happen, I want to know because I don't know what I should do with them. 
Can I fix that? Did I make a mistake? So I want to get informed when another than those three allowed error cases happen. So we wrote helpers for that to like catch those cases so we can easily write the error handling we need. Right? Uh, same on Windows, we have get last error. So a lot of functions fail and then the documentation tells you, yeah, if you want to know what happened, you have to call get last error. And so this is also a very frequent pattern you would have that you can maybe simplify to something like that. Okay, and now we're almost done. And now all we have to do is deliver the fix with all the good programming practices we hopefully all use already, right? So we document what we did. We document the why, for example. We tell people in our code why we did what we did when that is not obvious. Um, I want to point out a very important question that the next programmer is going to ask when he reads that piece of code or your bug fix is, do I still need this? Can I throw this out? Was this only relevant 10 years ago when we supported some system we don't support anymore? So you should maybe not only document the why you did something, but also the when can I remove this? Um, we're doing code reviews, of course. Let you explain to somebody else why you did something the way you did it. Maybe somebody else has better ideas. Maybe somebody else figured out that you didn't actually question all of your assumptions. Maybe there's something more you could have done to, to, to get to the real cause here of the problem. Good version control, I think that's something all, everybody uses. Who he uses version control? Good, I assume everybody else is a student. <laughs> and there are good techniques, they are often repeated. It should split your changes into self-contained parts, separate the parts that introduce new functionality from those that just refactor existing code. Check in the refactorings you did while you were debugging. Not together with the bug fix, obviously, but separately. And then add those tests. Those tests maybe that will also prevent the bug from reappearing, right? Uh, you need to think about your tests as deeply as you need to think about your code. If your test cases are all trivial, you're not going to find very interesting bugs, I guess. Uh, in the best case, maybe you can write tests that test your code against random input. In some cases, you can use random input and, let's say, a trivial, non-efficient data structure to test your implementation against a trivial, inefficient implementation. That's, that can be a good technique. And that closes the entire circle from getting more bug reports to making sure bugs don't happen again. And I hope that helps you write better bug-free software and shipping that. And with that, I say toda and uh, thank you for coming to my talk. So, do you have any questions? Or horror stories, <laughs> bugs you had. You don't write bugs, that's good. That's good. It's like, it's like David said yesterday, right? If you, don't, if you don't have a specification, you don't have a bug by definition. That's good. Yes. It's more performant than the question, but uh, turn on all your warnings and treat them as errors. Tr yes, turn on, I didn't say that, true. At Compound, turn on all your warnings and treat them as errors. Yes, that goes on the compile time error checking slide. Yes, that is very good. Yes. Uh, sorry, yeah, you need to, I think you need to come here and use the microphone because I don't hear you. Then we have a, the other rooms had microphones. Then, or, or you first because I hear you better. Just a question for you. What was the most difficult bug that you ever had to install? The most difficult bug I had, so we have this video outside where we, sh oh, sorry. we have this video outside where we show what our application does, right? And so it's an it's an add-on to PowerPoint, unfortunately. So that is our base. That's the base we run on, and um, we so we use the public API to some degree, uh, and they test that.
but they don't test it the way we use it. Let's put it that way. So we, we are not some small VBA add-in that adds some shape on your slide. Like we would go over all your slides, touch all your shapes. So if they have a performance bug somewhere, then we will probably encounter that. But so a lot of the hard bugs we had to investigate were related to PowerPoints. Like this disassembly example, of course, was uh, a bug that occurred after Office had ported PowerPoint to macOS. And they had made that long int mistake. So a lot of the difficult bugs um, come from that category. A colleague recently had an, an example, but that didn't fit on a slide. So just to show how crazy operating systems can be, is that um, you would get a bug in the rendering API where you have that, I don't know, begin drawing, end drawing call. And the end drawing call would say, somebody already called end drawing. Uh, you, had a, you know, you, you can't call it twice. But we didn't do that. So we had to figure out what happened, who had that bug that called end drawing, although it shouldn't have. Um, and it turned out what happened was that the customer had the Adobe Acrobat PDF extension, but not in Office, only in the Windows Explorer. But in Office, something would instantiate those shared libraries and they would instantiate those Explorer add-ins and they would run somehow. They would partially run in PowerPoint. That was crazy that you think that, why, right? Um, okay. Oh, and yeah, I also had a question. Yeah. Any tips on how to debug distributed systems? Ah, distributed systems. How to debug distributed systems. Um, so, yes and no, it depends. So they are independent distributed systems, but they're also, they, well, they in interact, right? And so when I have, so the only thing that I can think of that I think is systematically useful, except logging and seeing what you find out, right? Is that I try to go back and, and, and think, of the, think of the state machine they are trying to implement. And I would try to write down for myself what the state machine should be. So you have the first hint, if that gets too difficult, then maybe your state machine is too difficult. <laughs> <laughs> if you can't write that down, then that's your problem. And if you can write it down, and then you might also have an indication of where that is not happening, right? So that's the thinking part. And then, then comes the logging part and seeing how that fits together. But I think the state machine is a good, it's a good first step. Uh, also in answer to the question, you can also try to run the distributed system on a single computer, like uh, simulate it as if it were distributed, and then it would be easier to debug. Sometimes it can be, yeah, I didn't even, it can, the, the point was to run the distributed system on a single computer, but I didn't even understand her that way. It doesn't have to necessarily run on different computers in the first place. So we have a lot of processes that all belong to us, but they all run on the same computer anyway. So that's, I guess, also a frequent situation. Yeah. Anything else? No, then, well, I'm still outside in the, in the hall. If you have any other remarks, I'm happy to hear them. Thank you again. Thank you.